one of the things that interested me rereading it to prepare for beer and books was it's it's a much more difficult play than people give it credit give it credit for being. Mm -hmm. There's certainly the, the Catholic elements that you point out, Joseph. And I also read the Ignatius, uh, the Ignatius Press Critical Edition. Joseph is the editor of the Ignatius Press Critical Edition series, two of which I did the audiobooks for, Macbeth and uh, The Merchant of Venice. Mm -hmm. But they do lots of classics. They'll have the full text of the work, generally with an introduction mm -hmm. by Joseph, and then uh, the follow it up with maybe a half dozen or maybe a dozen um, critical essays, mm -hmm. what I would call from a sane perspective. Some of them are from a, a Christian perspective, mm -hmm. but some of them are at least looking at the books from a solid grounding. Uh, uh, and, and with Romeo and Juliet, there's some excellent essays. Yours is one of the best to, be, to begin the, in the introduction. Um, but one of the other things that I found in, in what I read, and I've got my old, this thing is from the 80s. This is the old Riverside Shakespeare. And this is, so you've got, uh, I think this was Frank Kermode uh, who wrote in his little intro to Romeo and Juliet, for the hot blood which makes love at once a matter of rapture and low jokes is the same that keeps warm the obsolete feud. So that interestingly, the feud and the passion of the lovers come from this same source. In many ways, it seems to be a play about what do we do with this passion? What do we do with the stuff that makes us want to fight? What do we do with the, one of stuff, with the stuff that makes us want to make love? And I think in the book, and I'll get to it maybe toward the end of our discussion here, mm -hmm. uh, Zelnick, um, I don't remember his first name, but he's got the last essay in that. Stephen. Print, Stephen Zelnick. I thought was the best essay in the book, the best critical approach to Romeo and Juliet. He says some amazing things. But since I'm talking to you, Joseph, and also to you, Sean, Sean, you've only read it in middle school. You've only seen kind of a parody production of it. But um, most high schoolers approach it with, oh, this is a story about tragic love. Oh, this is Leonardo DiCaprio and some hot chick. One of the things, though, that you point out, Joseph, is she's, Juliet is 13 years old in this story. And um, that was young. We think, oh, they got married a lot younger then. But uh, I think this may be in the, in the IP critical edition. One of the essays points out that, in fact, the average married, marriage age was uh, mid to late 20s in Elizabethan England. It would have been shocking and disturbing for them to think of a 13-year-old girl getting mm -hmm. married. So your approach to Romeo and Juliet is, is a very Catholic approach and an approach that really focuses on virtue and vice and the problems that passion can create for us. Talk a bit about the way you see the play, and I'll fill in with some of the stuff the other critics said in that in that book. Well, the, the, the first thing I'd like to say is that it's not my approach. <clears throat> no, I, 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 as a, as a, as a, a Catholic, I'm a realist. In other words, I believe in objective reality. So one of my approaches to literature, as to everything else in life, is to try to see things objectively. Now, in literature, that means trying to see th things as far as possible through the eyes of the author. In the case of Romeo and Juliet, try to, see, try to see things through the eyes of... William Shakespeare. And uh, my first book on Shakespeare, The Quest for Shakespeare, gave the evidence for Shakespeare's Catholicism. And that this is very important because, first of all, Shakespeare is a Catholic. He's also living in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. Uh, in other words, in a very different culture to post-romantic culture. And the way that we read uh, or see or understand Romeo and Juliet today is very much a romantic way of seeing things. And let's understand what we mean by romantic here. Romantic basically privileges feeling over reason. That's the, if you have to sum it up, you know, in, in one sentence, that's what it does. It privileges feeling over reason. So it's all about what people feel. So Romeo and Juliet's feelings are what matter. But that's not what Shakespeare's doing in the play. And if you actually read the play closely, read the words that the characters say, which of course are the words that Shakespeare's put in their mouth, it's quite clearly that passion, unguided by reason, is destructive and will lead to what it leads to. All of those that, 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 uh, that, that follow those, that, those viewpoints end up in bad positions. Mercutio follows his passions. He's dead. Romeo follows his passions. He's dead. Juliet follows her passions. She's dead. The and, and Frank Commode is right, he's not always right, but he's right in the sense that the hatred of the two clans is the same thing. It's putting feeling before reason. And Shakespeare's a Catholic, and what he's trying to do is say, look, we need to get back to philosophy here, we need to get back to an understanding that fides et ratio, 
faith and reason are married, they're indissoluble, you can't separate them, and when you do separate them, you end up with disaster. That's what's happening in Romeo and Juliet.